Hello and welcome to this week's Market Outlook webinar. If you're watching the recorded version of this, it was held live on Wednesday, October the 5th at 12.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I hold these in conjunction, conjunction with Aondo Markets. We do it every Wednesday lunchtime at 12.30. Then every other week um, I do an evening webinar, uh, on, normally on a Tuesday night, 7.30 on a Tuesday night where we look at, at social trading, because that's, uh, that's Aondo's thing, is social trading where you can copy and follow other traders. There's a bit more detail about that on my website that you can see up there. It's uh, tradeafter.com. I'll just put up the risk warning while I'm talking away. So today's webinar, we look at a mix of different markets. We look at a few currency pairs, <clears throat> uh, the major European and US indices, and gold and oil. And it's my background's technical analysis, and it's really to get a feeling for where the trends are, where they have been in the last few days, and um, what to look out for in the days ahead. It's been an odd week so far, as I'm sure if you've, if you've glanced at the papers, you've seen what's been going on. We've seen um, the pound against the dollar has hit a 31-year low, I think, this morning, back to um, June 1985 levels. And the FTSE, of course, yesterday, the FTSE 100, the blue chip index for the stock market, surged um, almost to all-time highs. It didn't quite close all-time highs, but, but above that 7,000 uh, level yesterday. I think the FTSE 250, the, the sort of the more broader index that's not so internationally focused, I think that did, did hit all-time highs. So we are seeing some, it's been an odd week, definitely an exciting week. Um, looking ahead to the rest of the week, it's the US non-farm payrolls on Friday lunchtime. So that's... Uh, 1.30 UK time, happens every month, and it's um, traditionally a very volatile time for the markets. It's the US unemployment number, so if you're around your screen at plus one on Friday, you might want to have a look at the markets, because they normally go, stock indices and currencies can go a little bit crazy when we find out the latest US unemployment numbers, but it does mean we could well be in for maybe a quiet day and a half until that happens. It, it does sometimes feel as if the market has a bit of a pause before the payrolls come out. So we'll start off anyway, what other chart can we start off with but the pound against the US dollar? Um, I must admit, I didn't, I didn't think we, we were going to come down here. Um, I thought that the low was just to walk through, just, just to remind ourselves what's happened the last few months. Uh, on, on EU referendum day, pound against the dollar, dollar touched 150, so a pound was worth a dollar fifty. Um, and the expectation was we were going to vote to stay in the EU. As the news broke overnight, you know, I, I saw like a lot of people, I stayed up overnight watching it on referendum night, and the market moves were, were incredible, you know, and as it, as, as it started to look as if the polls are wrong, we saw this massive sell-off uh, in the pound, you know, it touched, what, what almost, almost 132, it touched um, overnight in the early hours of the morning, um, which is a fall of 1,800 points from the high, so massive, massive volatility. And it did sell off over the next couple of weeks or so, and got as low as, I think, briefly below 128. So beginning of July, pound against the dollar, 127.96, according to this chart here. And then we saw you know, something of a rally. We saw it rally up to the 135 level. We saw that action by the Bank of England in August, uh, cutting rates to try and stimulate the economy. And we see it, we see it drift back to 129 August, then rally back up into September. Once again, I think we've picked out this this 135 level uh, quite a few times, you know, as, a, as something of a, a level to watch for when it comes uh, to, to, to a resist, resistance level. But I did think, well, if we see the market sell back off, you know, we'll see once again some buyers come back in ahead of the sort of 128, 129 zone, as we've seen quite a few times over recent months. You know, we've seen this as good support. And last week, it did like look, look like it was happening again. You know, we saw um, towards, what, the middle of last week, a bit of a rally, probably when we were doing this webinar this time last week, you know, a bit of a rally. And I was thinking, okay, well, here we go. We're going to go back up to 135 again. But over the weekend, we had um, the speech from Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister, and uh, suggesting that we were, that we could be in for something of a hard Brexit, you know, so-called hard Brexit, and saying that we're going to invoke um, Article 50 to start leaving the EU in the first quarter of last year, of next year, first quarter of last year, first quarter of next year. And I think some people, I don't know if, if maybe people didn't think this would ever happen, but clearly the markets are taking this news, you know, somewhat badly. I saw it, um, sort of some early trades going through on Sunday evening, and the pound was off about about 50 cents. Um, 
oh, 50 cents, 50 points, 50 points. So it was off a bit, but nothing too drastic. But then it's really accelerated uh, yesterday, yesterday morning. It absolutely nosedived through those lows uh, from July. And today it's pushed lower still. You know, So this is where we are. We're trading at 127.30-ish. We haven't been to this level, pound dollar, since June um, 1985, and uh, it's it's just all incredibly pessimistic, and that, that's despite we've had some good news this week uh, for the UK economy, and just this morning I think we've had some services data, some, some of that PMI services data, the Purchasing Managers Index, showing growth of I think it was 0.3% in the last quarter, and that's half what it was the quarter before, so it has slowed down, but it's above the 0.2% that the Bank of England uh, was forecasting. So, so the underlying UK economy is is okay, but of course the argument would be, well, we haven't actually started leaving the EU yet. You know, so there's there's always as ever two sides to this. I'm not too too concerned about about the political sides of it, but what it means uh, for the for the pound and for the markets. So, we're here. We're at a multi-decade low uh, for pounds against the US dollar. And I think however you cut it up, even though it can maybe, you know, be tempting to think, well, can it go any lower? Do I want to be a buyer? Um, I wouldn't. Just just yet. Let's have a look at an hourly chart. You know, we can see I'm always going on about trends uh, on these webinars. The trends pound against the dollar, you know, it's clear after it breaking that level that that trend is is most definitely still down. And it's difficult, you know, to, to make a bullish case or even you know a short-term bullish pay case until we at least reclaim the big level we lost uh, just at the beginning of the week, you know, 129. I think if it starts pushing up to there, then maybe we can think about about a stronger recovery. But at the moment, you know, as a good trend follower, you know, I'd have to say that uh, the sensible approach to take is to look to be a seller of rallies because it does feel as if there's sort of real fear and real real panic out there and when it comes to picking levels to go to look to go short you know we've seen okay a bit of a bounce back this morning off those early early morning lows this morning so we've seen a bit of a recovery but um, there's plenty of pockets of resistance and I'm, I'm a big fan of looking at previous days highs and lows particularly when we have the sort of moves that we've seen recently over the last couple of days, you know, we can see all these little these little pockets of resistance pound against the dollar from um, just early this morning, early hours of the morning, around about 127.50, uh, towards the end of the, the European session yesterday, 127.70, 127.80, and then back up 127.90. So, so for me, I'd be happy, you know, if we saw, you could argue that it's it's weakening now. It's only on a 10 minute candle, but it, it's pushing up to where it was. A little bit early this morning at 10 o'clock, and it's turning around again. So if you really wanted to go short, short, you know, we could go short here with a stop maybe somewhere above these sort of highs here. So I think we have to be just, just, just wary that this is a market that clearly has been clobbered. A lot of people, me included, you know, didn't expect this to happen. So we'll be nervous, I think, about about any potential for a sharp recovery. I think you'd be surprised to see a sharp, like a V-shaped recovery off these levels, famous last words. So I think we have to be wary of it if it pushes up into these sort of levels, you know, to still to look to see it run out of steam. Because it's all, you know, I think when we see moves like this, it is all about psychology, isn't it? And there'll be a lot of people maybe who would have bought in the sort of 128 area, maybe still holding on to positions, will be only happy to offload them if it starts pushing back back up to 128. So I think in the short term, uh, the next couple of days or so, we've got to be wary of any bounces and look to be a seller. Uh, and then going back, you know, I think the level it needs to break. I think my trend line slipped a bit there, but that that sort of 129 seems to be the level it needs to crack if we're going to sort of start turning a bit more positive, paying against the dollar. So, um, so for me, you know, rallies up to 129, I would still want to be a seller. But I think again, for me, the markets like this, they're difficult ones to trade when when they move so far, so fast. The levels they leave are a long way away, so I think they can be tricky, tricky markets to trade. The flip side, so we're saying, I'm saying the trend is down, blah blah blah. We should be looking to go short. The flip side, of course, is the psychological side, where if you read, if you if you read, uh, you know, the likes of Twitter and stuff, you know, it seems that it feels that everybody is really negative. And the flip side is, you know, when everyone thinks the market is going to just carry on going one way. That's exactly the time it's going to go the other way. I think a good example from last week, you know, something we, you couldn't get away from last week was Deutsche Bank. 
you know, I'm sure you. Um, hang on, let me have a let me have a quick look here. We we saw you know, the trials and tribulations of Deutsche Bank last week. Let's have a quick look on the on an hourly chart. You know, and it, because they've been slapped with this 14 billion dollar fine uh, from the U.S. from selling you know so-called toxic mortgage products uh, from back in back in the old days, and um, the, the share price has just been on an absolute um, death spiral, really. But I mean, it was already falling anyway before, before that came out. But last week, you know, there, there were people saying, "Is this Deutsche Bank going to be the next Lehman's?" All this sort of stuff, and it was enormously pessimistic. And of course, what happened at the end of the week? The shares went when everyone again was really, really negative on Friday, Thursday, Friday last week. It was re reaching like a crescendo of negativeness, negativity. That they hit ten dollars, ten euros a share, and they're currently trading just below twelve. You know, so we have seen you know a ten, almost a twenty percent turnaround, an eighteen percent turnaround uh, off those off those Friday lows. So there is, I think, whenever anybody thinks the market is just going to go in one direction, that's the time to get a little bit a little bit wary. And, and maybe you know, maybe with a, you could make the argument for the pound, but you know, it, it's only a couple of hours ago it hit its lowest point in thirty one years. So um, you're a braver man than me. If you call the bottom, but I think it's an interesting one to watch. But I would suggest that rallies still look like selling opportunities, pairing against the dollar. Of course, it's been a bit of a seesaw this week with the FTSE 100. Well, we'll come to the FTSE in a, in, in a bit. We'll carry on with our currencies because the FTSE's gone soaring higher as the pound's gone lower, and there are good reasons for that. But let's let's carry on looking at our currencies uh, for a bit. I think so. I've been wrong-footed on on the pound against the dollar because I didn't think it was going to go. Uh, and and break those lows. I thought the lows were in for the year. Famous last words. Um, but I think that a market that has performed, as I expected, is euro sterling. You know, clearly with the pound being so weak, um, you know, there's only one way that euro sterling was going to go. And we've seen euro sterling push higher. So this is this is a longer term chart for euro sterling. We are we are in a big area. I think I put this on Twitter earlier this week. This is uh this is the last seven years. Euro sterling. So it's a big picture for euro sterling. We'll zoom in in a second. So the euro against the pound, it's moved out to um, a three-year high. But 8,800 had been something of a barrier. It has sort of poked its head above that. But these, you can see the highs from um, 2013. Is it 2013? I think it is. Yeah, March 2013, July 2013, 8,800. So the euro would really bang its head up against these levels, and if it breaks there, there's no obvious resistance until nearly about about 91 for euro sterling. Um, so it's interesting up here, but you, you can't deny, you know, the, the trend for euro sterling is is clearly up. This is this is the daily chart that we're going to look at now. So we've had since uh, 2015, last year, end of 2015, we've had um, you know this 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 trend clawing its way higher. Looking something like that, and clearly, you know, it's accelerated uh, since then, since the old uh, the Brexit vote. You know, we've seen an acceleration, and um, you can see how well, though, this idea of previous levels, previous highs, previous lows has worked. You know, I think we were, we were talked we talked about this this sort of 8230 to 8300 level in the past. That's done a good job. It pushed up to 8700. It's broken out to that level, and again, it's pushed to a fresh high today. So for me, on Euro Sterling. It's maybe it's a it's maybe a cleaner trade I think than trying to trade the pound against the dollar because we have we have levels closer closer by. Uh, yesterday was it late yesterday or the early hours this morning? That looks like when was that big candle there? That was um, oh seven o'clock this morning. Seven o'clock this morning, it pushed out to that level. Uh, so that that's again a fresh three-year high for euro sterling. So for me, you know, euro sterling the default default position. I would want to be in is a buyer on weakness, you know. So we have our there's our little trend that's accelerated uh, this month. So and there's lots of pockets of support, you know. I'd, I'd, if we saw a sell-off back to this 87.20, 87.60 area, I still want to be a buyer. I think it's only if euro sterling drops below these lows from what is it? It's only it's only actually early in the week, isn't it? October the third. The low is around about. But 87.10, this sort of area, I think we start to look as if this, this breakout isn't really valid. But for me, you know, considering the, the beating up the pound has taken and maybe could could you know, still take, I'd still rather be a buyer of euro sterling on weakness uh, into that sort of zone. And that's based on the hourly charts and the daily charts. You know, the support is a long way away. It could sustain quite a big sell-off 
the euro, euro sterling from where it is now. And it is very overbought. If you look, look at traditional overbought, oversold indicators like this RSI down here, relative strength index, the market is overbought. But markets that are trending strongly, you know, can stay overbought for some time. But for me, any weakness in euro sterling looks like something of a buying opportunity. I think while that trend is still in place, euro dollar is a slightly different story. Euro dollar is just it's just a bit messed up at the moment, euro dollar. If you look at look at the dailies on euro dollar, it's really just gone nowhere. Um, so we, we have had, but I still think it's, I think longer term, euro dollar is positive because we had this period last year where it seems to have just formed this you know, sort of fairly significant base after sliding for quite some time against the dollar. I think the euro over the last year has built this base, but we're still, you know, stuck in the middle of the base. But we're trading now on euro dollar where it was what, nearly 18 months ago, you know, it's sort of stuck somewhat in the middle. And it's just a bit of a, a bit of a sideways, uh, not really trending market over, over recent weeks. There we go. So we did have, you know, something of a run up in the summer. Uh, but since then, you can see it's a market that's gone nowhere. That doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a buy weakness and sell strength market. This is, this is an hourly chart that we're looking at. And you can see, you know, over the last, the last few months, if we, if we see weakness back down, you know, to these, so this sort of area, sort of 1.1150-ish, if you want to be a buyer, and then sort of strength up to 1.1260-ish, you want to be a seller. And it's just stuck in the middle. So I think, you know, what can we say from here? Probably further chop. We'll see what happens on Friday when the payrolls come out on Friday. Let's see if that sort of sparks some life one way or the other into euro dollar. But I think it's a it's a quite a messy chart at the moment. And if you want to sit there and watch it and, and buy down here and sell up here, then fair enough. But I think it doesn't have you know the, the clear sort of trend like we're seeing on euro sterling at the moment after that breakout to three year highs. Let's look at a couple of others. Let's look at first of all um, dollar yen. This is interesting. Um, once again, this this big level um, has has done the business on, on dollar yen. You know, we've we've talked every time we, we come to dollar yen. You know, I talk about this this downtrend that's been in place for um, since the end of last year, and it's it's somewhat confused at the moment as to is is the market trying to break out of its downtrend. But I suppose it looks you know I don't know something something like this, and it's whether or not the recent moves are signs of that trend coming to an end. But you know these these levels, these lows, these recent lows over the last few months have done a fantastic job, uh, sort of what 99 to 100 sort of level. Have done a fantastic job of stopping any weakness, and it's happened again over the last week. You know we've seen when we were looking at this a week ago. Let's just get rid of that box for now. Looking at this a week ago, you know it's trading trading at these levels, and again it's moved up what a couple of hundred points. Or so um, dollar yen. So I think I think it's interesting. I think, but I think where it gets maybe really interesting is, is if it breaks 108. I think if it breaks the 108 level, then dollar yen it does start to look as if okay, that's it. That downtrend is over. So I think there's maybe scope for a bit more strength from where we are now. And it still looks like you know be quite nervous of rallies because the trend you could argue is technically still down. But there's that real floor, 99 to 100, that's really propped the price up. And Australian dollar, US dollar. I think this is the jury. I think is still a bit out <clears throat> on this one at the moment. I mean, the big picture for the Aussie dollar, US dollar, has been that long-term trend, and it's uh, it's whether or not that long-term trend is coming to an end. But it's it's at a real, I think, something about a critical sort of juncture. There we go. And so that's what our, that's what our trend looks like. You know, the story this year for the Australian dollar against the US dollar. Has been one of strength. You know, we have seen a recovery, but you can see over the last four or five months or so what a real barrier this 7,700 to 7,800 level has been. So um, again, I think it's um, it is make or break time. I think if we saw a move by the Aussie dollar, a decisive move to 7,800, it looks like that longer term downtrend is over, and it's time to get a lot more bullish. At the moment, it's just there are opportunities when it dips off towards 7,400. There appear to be opportunities, and I'd still say that was the case. Um, looking for maybe you know a couple of hundred points back up to 7,600, but we really need a break one way or the other to signal what the future could be for the Australian dollar over the next months. So 
in the immediate term, I think that the, the interesting ones to watch clearly pound against the dollar just because it's been battered so much and maybe not trust any rallies and still look for opportunities uh, to sell short. 129, I think, is the big level pounding against the dollar and euro sterling because that trend is still most definitely up. But let's look at stock markets. Um, so the newspapers today, you know, full of the moves in the FTSE. Uh, yesterday, let's just take let's take our FTSE chart back out. And if you're thinking, well, this is odd. Why is why is the FTSE um, going up when the pound is crashing through the floor? Yeah, it's just a very good reason for it. The, the FTSE 100, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, it's made up of international companies. It's not particularly a UK focused uh, index. You know, if you look at, you've got the likes of Glencore. Glaxo, Shell, uh, the major banks, you know, uh, other mining companies like um, I'm trying to think, Rio Tinto, all of those, you know, companies that derive their profits from overseas. So if they repat, when they repatriate those profits in in dollars or yen or whatever, uh, and they change them back, you know, it's a weaker pound is is better for their bottom line, you know. So a weak pound lifts the prof profitability uh, of those UK listed companies. Um, so that's you know one of the reasons why the FTSE 100 has got such a boost. And you can see it, you can see the move there, trading at 7,043 at the moment. It's come off a bit from those highs from yesterday. There we go, that's the daily chart we're looking at. But it's, you know, that's not a, not a bad run. Over the last, the last what, month or so, it's a market that's rallied three, four hundred points. So I think the breakthrough 7,000, I mean 7,000 is just, just a bit of a, a psychological level. But it had a good day yesterday. But saying all this, the U.S. stock market didn't, and you know I don't think the FTSE is going to carry on its merry way higher if the U.S. stock market suddenly decides to turn. But for now, at least, the sentiment is still positive. We'd looked, I think, over recent weeks at the big levels on the downsides uh, for the FTSE. If I plonk, this is this is still the daily chart that we're looking at here. So if we go. This sort of level here, we've been looking at as support ahead of 6,600, and it did its job again in early September, and the markets rallied off it. So I think we only need to turn sort of seriously pessimistic in the short to medium term on the FTSE if it drops below the 6,600 mark. So for now, at least, you know, I would say that the default position would be to still, you know, look to be a buyer. This is we've now flipped this over to uh, an hourly chart and we can see you know clear trends during September and of course uh, for this month maybe an aggressive trade you know is to take is to take the low actually you could argue there's a trade now I think if you've been on this webinar before I'll often talk about you know if you're if you want to be a, a day trader in and out during the day the importance of yesterday's high and low and you can see already the FTSE when it sold off yesterday afternoon whereas at the lows yesterday were it was five o'clock last night, so it was the out of hours market. But the lows were seven thousand and twenty-seven, and the low today is seven thousand twenty-six point eight. So you could say the the aggressive trade is to be a buyer here with a stop loss under there somewhere, looking to see if we can regain these levels from yesterday. But clearly, you know, these levels just before the break, sixty-nine fifty, are important ones as well. So I'd be inclined to maybe be a buyer of the dips <clears throat> on the FTSE. And looking at this on the RSI, I'm not. I'm not as I said before, I'm not a massive fan of overbought, oversold, but for those who are, you know, the, the cool off that we saw late yesterday afternoon and today has helped this RSI become a bit less overbought than when it was when the market surged higher. But I think the market to watch is uh, going to be the, the, S, the S&P 500. We'll look at the Dow in a second, but I think the S&P 500 is an interesting one. It's got a bit of a lift on in the last, uh, the last few minutes or so. But... Um, so the S&P 500 is the broader U.S. stock market index, and I, I trade uh, quite a few U.S. stocks, sort of holding a medium term, long and short. So I keep an eye on what it's doing during, during the day. And this is the last few months. Again, there's the old Brexit volatility, the move higher sideways. Then there was that Friday, a few Fridays ago, where it absolutely fell off a cliff. Stock markets fell off a cliff. The Dow was down 3.8% of the day, something like that. And, um, but since then, the market it has been clawing its way higher. And if you look on the hourly charts, I think we're still just about, just about, in that sort of that trend higher off those those lows that we saw on the 12th of September. So for me, 
I would still be inclined to be a buyer of weakness in US markets. So if we, if, we, if I took it something like this, so the trend, I've got it, I think I've got another chart from the day. So my trend arguably looks like that. So you could say over yesterday, it did fall through it. Okay, so that's, it's a sign that maybe it has run out of some momentum. But for me, we've got, and you'll see this on, a Dow, on the Dow in a second, we'll look on the Dow, we've got lots of sort of individual pockets of support that have been left by the various dips over the last few weeks. So famous last words, you know, I'm not expecting US stock markets to go falling off a cliff anytime soon. You know, I think we had, I, I, I'll have a look at a, a really short term chart in a minute, but you know, we, we, we've come back down this level here, 2142, the lows from the end of September, 2140, and the lows from the last week of September, around 2130. So it, it's a market that hasn't exactly made a lot of progress in the last couple of weeks, but whenever it's got knocked down, the buyers have been only happy to step in. So I'm still mildly bullish, I think, on US stock markets in the week ahead. Of course, that could all go completely out the window on Friday when we get those uh, those non-farm payrolls, but I think there, there are lots of support. So for me, famous last words, it's difficult to see US indices sort of falling like a knife through butter uh, through all these levels over the next few days, but let's see what happens. I put something on Twitter yesterday, there was an interesting trading opportunity yesterday where, again, going back to my my favorite subjects, the previous days, high and low, and it, was, it happened in the first hour or so. Uh, so this, these are the lows from the day before yesterday. So if I plonk a, a line on there, hang on, long line, no, it's, a, it's the right line, horizontal high and low. So that, that was the low. And I was looking at it uh, yesterday on Twitter in the, fir the first sort of hour or so of proper trading. And the market just, just tanked really heavily towards these lows. And I just said, well, is this going to be a buying opportunity? We can see the lows hold. And the market just turned around really sharply. And then we had the same thing again. It was a really odd first couple of hours yesterday. It did spike through, then it ran about. But it, if you, we'll see it in the Dow in a minute. It was moving through 200 points up and down uh, every half hour, but not actually going anywhere. And then finally, as the day went on, we had this quite a negative finish in the US session based on a really short-term chart. So we did see uh, a bit of a swing. But I think for me, based on those hourlies, I think the bias is still just about up. We'll see. We'll see what today looks like. But as I say, with the unemployment numbers on Friday, don't be surprised to see maybe a, a boring couple of days for US stock markets. But just to look at the Dow to show you, I mean, the Dow, you maybe see slightly more exaggerated levels on the Dow, but, but the same sort of thing, you know, you can see it. So the Dow, look, look at these sort of these sort of spiky moves lower. So when, when we see the market sort of pushing down to you know these these sort of lows uh, from much like September, sort of around about 18,100, 18,050. We see the buyers uh, come back in, and overnight we've seen a similar thing. It's come back to 18,100, and lo and behold, it's moved 100 points off that level. So I think there's still a tendency out there to be a buyer of dips in U.S. markets. I think it's only if we see some of those levels break that we have to worry. But that was the move yesterday in the Dow. We saw it in the S&P, sells off, gets near yesterday's lows, and then promptly rallies. Oh, it was 100 points, a couple, not a couple of 100 points, 100 points higher, and then does the same thing again before finally closing, closing lower. So a weak finish yesterday, but I think the bias is still just about up for US stock markets. Let's see what Friday brings. So there's stock markets, I think still, still mildly bullish. Um, let's have a look at some of the commodities, because we've seen again gold. That was, I mean, it's a massive move yesterday in the price of gold. So um, this, this is uh, the last couple of days chart, but you can see the move from sort of 13.10 to as low as the sort of 12.60, 12.70 area, which has completely thrown my view on gold or my short-term view on gold out the window. I've been banging on the last few weeks about this, this sort of 1300 level in gold, about how it's, um, obviously the last few months, about how it's provided good support. Let me plonk our line on there. So 1300 really has been the line in the sand for the price of gold. And whenever we've seen weakness to it, you know, we've seen the buyers come back in and we've seen it rally, you know, 30, 40 dollars off that level. But I suppose you could say with our hindsight hats on, you know, each rally has been getting sort of smaller and smaller. So the 
I'm not I'm not a massive fan of patterns, but I'm sure people say we've got something of a bit of a triangle thing going on from the top here. But for me, you know, my my sort of bias on gold was based on the trend this year. So if we let's take a look, you know, off off the lows or from from the end of last year, I should say maybe, you know, it was looking something like that. So for me, 1300 was important because it was trend support and also that support support. But just because the trend line has been lost, um, for me it doesn't mean the trend is over. You know, you rarely see a market break its trend line and suddenly bang, it goes all the way back to where it started. So I would, although not today, I'd still be inclined to look for the price of gold to recover. And it's all about maybe how it performs near previous levels. So for me, you know, the, there we go, 1250 is something of a level for gold. I'd only, I would only throw the hat in on a bullish argument if it broke below those, those may lows. So I, even though it got clobbered yesterday, I'd still be looking for a run back up above 1300 when some of the dust settles on this move. So for me, you know, 1250 is a big level. So it maybe if it drifts off over the next few days, but we see some support ahead of 1250, for me, that maybe starts to look like an opportunity. But I mean, yesterday does show, you know, the importance of having stop losses. You know, you can, and you can see. I mean, clearly there were plenty of people looking at that 1300 level. It's a big level. There were lots of, you know, it must have been lots of maybe sell orders clustered around there because you can see once it started moving, it hardly looked back. You know, we saw this this very sharp, very sharp sell off. Bit of a quiet day today, but um, so one day of big falls has knocked it back to where it was uh, sort of actually just just after Brexit, so just after the EU referendum vote. Uh, and for me, let's see what happens. I don't think that trend is over yet. I'd be looking for maybe some recovery from here, but I'm quite happy to sit on my hands for a couple of days. And then finally, on the commodity front, is the price of oil. Which oil is it? Let me pick the right contract. This is interesting. I think I've been saying for the last few weeks, it's a hard, it's, for me, it's been a hard one to call. The bias is slightly more up than down, but it's been difficult oil. This is a for me anyway. This is a daily chart. So we had um, clearly we had that the, the big sell-off beginning of the year, sort of down to about twenty-six, twenty-eight dollars a barrel. Then the big recovery uh, into June, sort of back up above fifty, and then the sell-off and it's gone chop, 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 chop. But um, today or over the last couple of days, we're seeing it move higher. So it's now at its highest levels uh, since since July. So we're at sort of. Uh, a three-month high in the price of oil, but clearly the big test is going to be if and how it performs uh, if it gets back to the highs of the year. So on this one, on the this is the November crude oil, U.S. crude oil contracts. So just above $52 a barrel. How does it perform up there? But but undoubtedly, you know, for the if you're looking at the short-term chart, like an hourly chart or a 10-minute chart, you do not need a PhD in applied maths to see which way. The trend is, and the trend is clearly up, and it's done. It's done a great job. This trend, you know. Again, it's done. It's my my favourite previous day's lows. Whenever it's sold off, it's been a great trend because it hasn't punctured the previous day low. So again, with our our hindsight trading hat on, you know, if we were a buyer and we're whacking our stop under the previous day low, we would have been able to ride this trend. We would still be in this trend now. Uh, so. Um, Maybe that's the first warning sign that it's starting to run out of steam if it does start to slip below yesterday's low. And at the moment, that level from from yesterday is a, is a roundabout here. So we're sitting, what's that, around about $48.20 a barrel. But um, it'd be interesting to see. It's, I mean, it's only 40 cents away from $50 now. So the bias is still up. So in the short term, it's still up. But you would expect that 52, sort of the whole 51 to 52 area to be something of a problem for the progress in the price of oil. If it breaks there, though, it's another big breakout again. You know, it's a it's a suggestion that that maybe things are changing. You know, we have to start looking at maybe these levels from May last year up in the 60s. So let's see. It's an interesting one to keep an eye on that one. So gold has been clobbered, but I still think we might see it stage another attempt to get back above 1300. The price of oil has woken up over the last week. And has pushed out to its best levels uh, for for a few weeks. So um, let's see, let's see what happens. Some interesting markets to watch. Someone asked about Tesco as well. We don't normally do it, do a uh, individual shares, but but it's an interesting one, Tesco, because Tesco is the uh, the UK supermarket chain. But 
it's interesting because they came out with results when I think they're six month results and they've got a pensions deficit but the market seems to have ignored that completely and um, focused on the numbers and the share price is up 11% on the day so applying you know, the same sort of principles you can see the size of the move there let's, let's make it let's make it a daily I think it's an interesting one we looked I think we looked at, at Shell the other week as an individual share you know, Tesco in recent years has been mired in that, that accounting scandal they had where they were booking profits wrongly, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. But I think for the for the longer term investor, you know, we did have our trends, you know, it'd been down for Tesco, and like a lot of markets, you know, breaks the trend line, but doesn't immediately reverse. But the move we've seen today puts the Tesco share price at its best levels. Uh, in more than a year, you know, so it's a it's a real breakout on Tesco. So for me, like I say, I always have a problem buying markets when they move, or selling markets when they move sharply, because there's nowhere really to put the stop. You know, it's moved 11% today. So even if I put a stop below yesterday's low, it's going to be more than 11% away from where it is. So for me, in an ideal world, Tesco will sell off a bit from here, uh, come back a bit, and give us an opportunity to buy in. But I think today that move in Tesco uh, does suggest that you know more than the, the, the worst is behind it and I think it's a, it's an interesting one, an interesting sort of UK blue chip that reported today and has uh, sort of confirmed that change of trend on the chart so I'd definitely be inclined to be a buyer of dips in Tesco in the weeks and the months ahead. Let's see, let's see what happens but that's it, that's it for today, we'll start wrapping things up, um, it's just gone one o'clock so the pound is the interesting one to keep an eye on obviously because it's been clobbered so much but I would be wary of trying to pick the bottom I think you know any any rallies could still run out of steam for now. Let's see where we are in a week's time. Euro sterling is maybe the better way I think to trade. Is maybe a bit less volatile than a pound against a dollar, and I'd be inclined to think that Euro sterling could push it push a bit higher. But 8800 has been a problem. Stock markets still it's been an odd sort of choppy couple of weeks for stock markets, but U.S. markets still look I think mildly bullish. Lots of support. On the hourly charts, just below, you know, where we are now. So again, it looks, you know, any weakness still looks to be uh, something of a buying opportunity. Gold got clobbered yesterday, but I don't think that's the end of the trend just yet. But I'd rather it settle down a little bit first of all. And um, on Friday, it's the non-farm payrolls. So 1:30 on Friday, it could all be um, all out the window again. We'll see what those U.S. unemployment numbers look like. But for now, um, we'll wrap things up uh, for today. If you have any questions, drop me an email, david at tradeafter.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I try If there's any interesting chart stuff going on, I'll try and put it on Twitter, and it's at Jones the Markets uh, is my Twitter thingamajiggy. And um, for, for more information on the social trading stuff I'm doing with Aondo, if you go to tradeafter.com, there's information on there. But for now, we will wrap things up. Um, hope you enjoyed today, and we'll do this all again next Wednesday lunchtime at 12.30. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.